with a talk, even though he's still in his pajamas. Nice front one. <laughs> you guys hear me okay? Uh, yeah. Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> Gets me out of bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah. So, in honor of it being so early, I have some prizes to give away in the form of my shot glasses that I won at Hacker Trivia, which were washed. I washed them this morning, and I have a bunch of stickers. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about Logstash. Logstash is a project I write. It's open source. It's awesome. And this is a love story. So firstly, who am I? I'm a sysadmin. I code. I work right now at logly.com, which does something similar to Logstash I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and it's not a sales pitch. Um, I like rum and beer, uh, but I do not like tequila. This is the face I make when I drink tequila. Uh, this is not a happy face. <laughs> Uh, so what else do I do? I work on a number of open, random open source projects because I don't like doing housework, and I procrastinate on that by writing code. My, my wife agrees. Um, I work on another, uh, another, a number of projects. If you've ever been to ShmooCon, the past couple of years, Hacker Halo, and this past year, Hack Fortress, I've done a lot of that stuff. Uh, mostly cat herding and writing really crappy code at the very last minute to make the competition go. Uh, <laughs> very la Literally, like I show up at the con, and then we start writing puzzles. <laughs> Um, I'm also steering this project with uh, an open source project I wrote called Finger Pokin. Uh, if you get bored at the talk, uh, please feel free to try and hack it. That's not a challenge, I just think it would be funny. Um, and sometimes I hate things. Much, much of the stuff, much of the code I, I write uh, is, is sort of hate driven. Um, so let's talk about loving your logs. Now that I've shared the, my vulnerable tequila face moment with you, we can all come together um, in a nice space and learn to love things. So firstly, SSH grep and tail don't really scale well. Um, if you have more than five machines, you know, if, if you're at a big infrastructure, maybe that you don't even have SSH because you're they're on Windows boxes. Maybe you can't even log in because they're embedded devices. You have some bullshit policy that prevents you from logging to machines and getting access to stuff that would help you debug or find security problems. Um, when, like Windows has the event viewer, you can't really SSH into that and tail it. But firstly, I'd like to talk a little bit about stuff other in this space. Uh, Logly is an example. Um, it's logging as a service, you sign up, there's free accounts, it's no bullshit free account, you can keep it forever. Uh, it's like a pay for a model where you pay for what you use, <coughs> and you just send your logs up, and you get a nice interface and an API on top of that. But Logly is not Logstash, they're completely separate code bases. Uh, Logly is a bunch of Python and a bunch of Java, and Logstash is a bunch of Ruby. But Logly likes to support open source software, so they help me get to conferences like this, to, and they help fund other work on Logstash. Another example of a project in this space is called Greylog2. Uh, Greylog2 is also open source, it's free. Uh, you take your logs, shove them into MongoDB, and it gives you a nice, nice front end on top of that. Logstash and Greylog are used together quite a bit because some people don't like the web front end for that Logstash has. I don't blame you. Uh, but you can use Logstash to get your crap into Greylog. So what is Logstash? You take events, ship them somewhere, and make them useful. But don't be annoying about it. I really hate annoying software. First, Logstash is open source. The license is BSD, which means I don't really care what you do with it. If you use it and you love it and you never tell me, that's cool with me. Um, the idea is that it, it, the BSD license lets you use it under any circumstances. So if there's, like, GPL I know has some weird viral clauses that keep you from using it in certain cases, and some companies are very afraid of using code like that. Um, secondly, open source is great. It builds a community. It gets you hired. This is why I work at Logly. Um, and it also undermines crappy commercial services which is awesome. Um, secondly, log, Logstash should fit your environment. And by that I mean, if you already have like a centralized logging system, you shouldn't have to like throw that away or, or make significant changes to get Logstash to work for you. If there's a part of Logstash you don't want to use, for example, that you hate, like the web interface, you should be able to swap it out with something that's less crappy. Um, and there's other, th other examples that should be extendable. Right? It shouldn't be this like, huge monolithic piece of crap that you can't inspect or debug or extend if you have 
some weird requirements, like you want to start logging from applications on your phone, for example. So here's a, a rough diagram of crap coming out of your servers and going to somewhere else. This is what Logstash lets you do. Um, there's no particular inputs or outputs that Logstash uh, requires you to write to. You can take your, your data from server logs, from application stack traces, from click tracking and advertising, or from router logs or embedded devices and ship them anywhere you want, assuming there's code to do it. The, and that's done using the Logstash agent, which is three main components. Uh, it works similarly to the Unix pipeline, where you have inputs, filters, and outputs, cat being a kind of input, grep, and Perl and sed being kind of filters. Uh, so what inputs do we have? You can read events from files, that's really common. You can have syslog servers. Uh, message brokers are getting more popular uh, these days for sending stuff around because I guess normal routers aren't cool enough anymore. You need more things to debug. Uh, you can pull data in from Twitter's stream API. Uh, you, can email, you can email input, so that's from cron jobs and things like that. Um, and if you emit events another way that's not currently supported, it's only going to be a couple lines of code to make that work. So I mentioned filters. So, so what filters are, are, do you have? Um, firstly, a lot of logs are in a really crappy format. And if you have, multi if you have different applications, I pretty much guarantee they're going to be logging in a different format. So you need different parsers and whatever to figure out what each log is going to mean. Most log formats tr seem to aim to be human readable, but most of the time they're not readable by humans or machines, especially in aggregate, right? And filters exist to parse them as something better, give them structure. So where can you output? You can output events to AMQP, that's a message broker system. You can output it to Graylog, you can send it to Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is an open source tool for full text indexing. Uh, you can send it to your monitoring system, like Nagios. Um, or you can send it to a web browser using that Web 2.0 shit. Uh, so file input, uh, most applications are capable, on servers are capable of logging to files. Logstash is capable of doing roughly tail dash f on them and it'll try and be smart about following them if the file's been rotated, things like that. You can also watch uh, wildcards, so if you log to an unknown file name, like it's the application name dot timestamp, you can just give it a wildcard there and it'll figure out the right thing to do. You can input from syslog, let's say you have routers or embedded devices that can only output, only lo send logs to either some internal buffer that gets thrown away, which you don't want, or you can send it to a syslog server, uh, Logstash provides that. You can take data on standard input. Um, I said it, this, this mirrors the Unix model, it wouldn't be Unix if it didn't take standard input, I think. And since message brokers are all the rage, you might as well set, ship those over uh, brokers. This is great for broadcasting events if you have multiple publishers or multiple subscribers on different channels of data. So we, it also supports uh, Twitter stream. Um, I don't know if that's going to be terribly useful, but it is great for getting a random source of data. And frankly, my, my workstation at home doesn't generate that much log, so Twitter was a good, a good example. So on to filters. Uh, the date filter exists because everyone invents their own stupid time format, and more on this in a little bit. In Logstash, each event, every event in a, in a, in a logging or event system has a timestamp on it, right? Um, Syslog uses one format, yada, yada, yada. Um, so the date filter lets you parse that and make it something useful that you can sort on and search on later. The grep filter works similarly to the grep tool. You give it a regular expression and it drops things that don't match, or you can make it an invert match where it will drop things that do match. Grok is a filter for parsing uh, very complex log formats. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Grok in a minute. Um, Grok discovery is sort of like Grok, but inverted, and again, I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, Multi-line filter is good for your Java applications, your Rails applications that don't really know how to log all that information in one single line, and they split them on multiple lines. And a great example of this is Java stack traces, where the first line is like a timestamp and some crap, and then everything else is indented by some kind of thing that you can match on. That's what this is for, and it lets you take multiple lines of the log file and mash it all together in one event. So on to outputs. The main output I like is Elasticsearch. It's, it uses uh, Lucene, which is a full text search uh, system on the back end. Um, it's open source, it scales. Um, yeah, it, and, and it's uh, free, and the community support for it is really good. Uh, just like you can input from message brokers, it, you can output to them as well. This lets you take data from your, your remote nodes and ship them over a message system to something that reads them later and indexes them. I mentioned Greylog2 earlier. A lot of people prefer the web interface of Greylog2 over, uh, over Logstash itself. That's cool with me. You can output to Greylog. 
Um, the reason for this is Graylog only supports syslog by default in its own internal message format, so you can use any of the inputs that, that Logstash supports, plus the filters, and just sh shift that off to Graylog. So we can also output uh, events to NoSQL databases like MongoDB, if that's what you want to be doing. Um, what else? There are a lot of bad tools uh, for watching errors in log files. Um, there's some that come by default, I think, with Nagios. I haven't, I haven't used them in quite some time, but they're not very good. But with a Logstash model, you can easily stream data from log, from log files, syslog stuff, et cetera, and then figure out what is an error to you and have that alert you. And again, we support WebSockets in case you want uh, real-time event streams in your browser for dashboards or things like that. So about Grok. Regular expressions are pretty awesome. It gives you a compact syntax for writing a sort of pattern matching system, a pattern matching machine. And they're pretty useful, but they're pretty awful. Writing them is hard, maintaining them is harder, and debugging them is even worse, especially as they, get, as they grow. <clears throat> and nobody tests them either, right? Do you guys write unit tests for, no? Yeah, nobody does, exactly. You write once and you kind of hope that it works in the future. And nobody really reuses uh, patterns they've written before, which helps ensure that you always go, every time you write a regular expression, you always go through that painful cycle of write it, hope it works, don't bother maintaining it because maintaining it sucks, debugging it sucks. So if regular expressions are so terrible, why do developers keep writing crappy log formats, right? You see, there was a, there's a good XKCD comic where some guy's like flying in and types a bunch of Perl on a keyboard and then flies away because somebody needs to get some addresses out of some emails. Um, I think that's a good use case uh, for saying like regular expressions, we could do a lot of cool stuff with it, but if logs are, are inherently structured, right, you've got a timestamp, you have some kind of message, and maybe you have some other metadata, if you jam that all into one string, you've lost all of that structure. And computers are really crappy about figuring it out, right? You have to, you as a human have to write some code to, to parse all this crap. So you end up with a few hundred tools, all logging in totally random formats, and that sucks. So, what does this pattern match? Months and days? Who said Apache? Would you like a shot glass? Someone can fill it for you, I'm sure. It's not too early. And have a sticker, I have too many. Can you prove that it matches an Apache log? What's that? You can. Yeah. So you, you can prove that it does or does not match one. Can you spot the bug? Is there a bug? Can you code review this? I wouldn't. I'd table that shit. <laughs> I would just say it looks good to me. What is Feptober? I don't support that, I'm sorry. So you guessed right, this is for Apache logs, but good luck debugging and writing maintain that crap. And frankly, if you were writing an Apache log parser, you wouldn't write something like that, this, that's this complex. Like you know that you wouldn't match sept or the, sep the full word September, right? Because that doesn't new usually appear in the log. It's just gonna be SEP. Um, so there, it looks like there might be some, some code generation going on here. The problem is more than just regular expressions. Humans can't process logs in aggregate, right? If you look at a bunch of Apache log lines, what do you, what do you, what do you see? Can you do like a group by on that in your brain over a thousand lines? I can't. Um, and computers can't process them either because they don't have any hinting about what the format is supposed to be. So they don't know that what is the, what's the HTTP response code or things like that. So here's an example of an Apache log that hopefully is matched by that pattern that we may or may not have tested. Um, in this example, let's, let's say we want to do some kind of analytics on the response code. Maybe we want to get, maybe our boss is saying, well, how many errors have we served in the past month? We want that value. Now, if I use grep for another shot class, can you show me the five possible places in this log where you will also find 200. Or you could also find 200. You can find any year. 
Do you want a shot glass? Yep. Time zone. Take my shot glasses. You and whoever said time zone. Um, and then I think also the request path, right? And email? That's the user agent, sir. <laughs> Someone will fill it for you. I was, I was too tired to fill it this morning. My bad. <laughs> my shot glass is empty. No. So yeah, they can appear here. So grab kind of sucks for this tool. Even if you wanted to start with like grab or awk, you're, you've already lost, right? So this would be better. You can't, it's, it's harder, you can still, you still have the grep problem, but if you're using grep on this format, you're doing it wrong. This is, uh, hopefully you, you recognize, this is JSON, but each thing is basically a hash, right? It tells you what the client address is, what the user, he was not logged in, so it's null. There's a timestamp in a better format. Uh, you know what request, blah, 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 you know the HTTP version, all that crap, and it wasn't in one giant string that you had to write a regular, regular expression for. So why is this better? It's structured. Pretty much every language on the planet can parse JSON these days. So you don't have to write code to do it, and it's test, hopefully someone has tested the JSON library you're using, for example. And there's no custom code to write, because it's easy to parse. It's queryable, you can just ask for the response code. You don't have to figure out where in the string it lives. And best of all, you didn't have to write, maintain, and debug a regular expression that looked like that full page slide. And it's cool with me if you don't use JSON, right? Maybe you use a binary format. Maybe you have a custom thing. Maybe your company hates you and you have to use XML. Uh, just use something structured because that way you can query it later. I have another rant. Please stop inventing time formats. This makes me rage. Why should you stop reinventing time formats? Well, Nagios uses this number. What is this called? You can have a sticker. You, who said that? You can have a sticker if you want one. Or all of them. Cover your room in my stickers. Sweet. Yeah. What is this missing? What? Milliseconds, that's correct. Anything else? Time zone? Microseconds? <laughs> I don't have a schmoo ball to throw at you. I'm sorry. Yes, it is missing time zone. It's, it's missing fractions of a second. Um, <laughs> some syslogs use this. What are problems with this one? <laughs> no year. Yes. It also is English leaning. It says oct, which is hopefully October, assuming it's English. <laughs> Yo. Um, Apache uses this crappy format, which is another inventive one. What's the problem with this one? Beside it being retarded. No, no microseconds, right? If you have Apache running on a, on a real web server with real traffic, you probably want sub-second values about request times. How about this one? MySQL loves inventing random bullshit time formats. You don't even know. You hope the first two digits might be here. <laughs> also no microseconds and no timestamp, or no time, time zone. I don't know if the guy, you guys in the back can see this, but at Logly, our Java apps use this thing. <laughs> it's, yeah, they're, they're coordinates. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, the error was here. What time? I don't know. <laughs> it must be Heisenberg, right? We can tell you where, but not when. And he uses a comma for hopefully that's microsecond or milliseconds. I'm not totally sure. Stargate. Stargate. <laughs> you guys are going to ruin me. So if you shouldn't invent your own timestamp format, what should you use? You should use ISO 8601. And you can buy the standard, and I'm sure it like costs $1,000, or you can just read the Wikipedia article about it. Um, or this is basically all the information you need. It supports fractions of a second, time zone offsets. Uh, it's not English-leaning, but it is that you know, normal 2,000-year calendar type shit. 
Um, and it supports lots of optional fields. If you don't have, don't laugh at me. If, <laughs> you're screwed. <laughs> Please invent your own time format then. I, I applaud. But yeah, all of, this, all of these are valid and some of the fields are optional. You don't have to have the time if, if when you, for the event that, that happened, it's not a time, it's not a uh, specific hour, minute, second, whatever. Z is for Zulu, which is UTC. It does accept, uh, unless you're comparing uh, different time zones, right? But I totally agree with you, that does sort properly, right? If you look at the syslog time format, like the month name is first, and that doesn't sort at all, right? So please stop inventing top t terrible log formats. Don't, inv don't take some giant printf string and hope that it's gonna be useful later. If you have structured data already, just output it structured. And don't invent time, time formats because you're gonna do it wrong. Don't, don't, listen, don't do anything MySQL does. So I mentioned Grok earlier. Grok exists to sort of solve this problem of people writing terrible log formats because I know people aren't gonna change. And also parsing timestamps out of, out of data and things like that. It lets you write a regular expression once, it lets you test them, and it lets you reuse them over and over. Sort of breaking that horrible vicious cycle of write a terrible, hopefully working, regular expression maintaining it maybe, and debugging it hopefully, or you know, you hire a consultant because you can't read your own Perl three months later. So here's some examples of default patterns that ship with Grok. Um, IP or host, host name, IP. You see, IP or host is just an or of host name and IP. Um, I didn't include the full one because they're kind of long sometimes. Um, it ships with about 100 default patterns that you don't have to write, so what ships with it? Uh, network patterns like MAC address format, common MAC address formats, uh, Windows likes to use its own little, it uses dashes, I think, for Mac, Mac addresses. Uh, Unix format, which is uh, each octet has colons, and then I think Cisco uses four in a dot or four in a colon or something like that. Um, it supports all of that uh, by default, so you don't have to write it. It supports numerical patterns for uh, integer, integer numbers, floating point value, values, hexadecimal, uh, scientific notation, so you don't have to write those. It comes with date patterns for months, like you saw in that generated pattern for Apache. Uh, days of the week, ISO 8601, which is that timestamp you should all be using. Um, syslog timestamps, time which is what you shouldn't be using, um, but if you have no other option. It also supports uh, US and European date, uh, date formats. Um, and it also comes with uh, complex formats like quoted strings, which is not a trivial regular expression to write. Uh, URLs, which is madness to write. Um, and syslog headers. I mentioned testing patterns. This is the output of the test suite for Grok. Almost all of the code f is not necessarily unit testing Grok's internals, but testing the patterns it ships with. And it, t and it runs 70,000 checks, and that's growing every time I find a bug. Um, so, you, so you have better confidence about the patterns that you might, you might be writing with Grok. Grok Discovery builds on top of what Grok already provides because it ships with a library of patterns, you know, that host name, dates, numbers, that kind of stuff. And you start with a sample plain text, which it might be a piece, of, a piece of a log file. And it tries to find patterns that match that. So it'll look, look at your plain text and see, I'll, I have a host name pattern, does that match? Try and, uh, try and generate a pattern for you. So here's an example of a syslog line and after you run it through uh, syslog discovery or Grok Discovery, sorry. Um, it found out that the first chunk of that was what I call syslog base. Um, and, then it uses, and it figures out the rest is not actually a regular expression, it's actually a constant. So it, rather than writing a regular expression that matches a syslog line, you run it through Grok Discovery and it generates one for you. So now, instead of writing a regular expression, hoping it works, and repeating this mad cycle over and over, you're not even writing them anymore. You're getting this like hinted uh, version of a, of a pattern that is hopefully tested uh, by me and other guys who work on Grok. And again, you didn't have to write this, right? The pattern at the top, you started with a piece of text from a file and it gave you a pattern, and that pattern is actually represented as this. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that we have, that it ships with a bunch of patterns and it starts off, the syslog base is actually, uh, I don't know if you guys at the back can see, but it, it breaks down into a timestamp, a host, and a, the program name, which also breaks down into other things. It, syslog timestamp starts with month, day, and then in some hour, minute, whatever. 
and you can see that hopefully in here, you can see that the first thing is probably a month, and then somewhere along the lines it starts matching numbers, and then I can't read the rest of that, it's too early. Ah, host name, that 0 comma 62 stuff, the RFC says the host names can only be 62 characters long between dots or some bullshit, um, so that's what I rolled with. So you get patterns automatically generated for you. You never had to write a regular expression. You don't have to be a computer science major to understand finite state machines, to write this bullshit, to match stuff that people wrote in logs that were crappy. <laughs> I hate crappy logs. So each piece that Grok, Grok uses for you is tested and reusable, so you don't have to worry about that horrible cycle. So each log stash agent, moving on a little bit, is capable of taking having an input each, a bunch of filters, and a bunch of outputs. This is an exa a simple example. If you were to run Logstash on a, on a single host yourself, you have a bunch of files as input. You could have some database logs, uh, things like that. Um, and you have a bunch of filters. You might use Grok first to sort of parse the, the crappy log formats into something internally structured. You use a date parser to, to take the dates that Grok found from the, from the, uh, the logs and turn them into a real time stamp. And Maybe you have some Java logs or whatever, and you want to use multi-line to jam a bunch of stuff into one log or one event, and then you ship it off in Elasticsearch. Here's a slightly more complex example. If you have a bigger infrastructure, you might have a bunch of servers doing, doing that same thing in the last slide. Um, all of them, this is what one server might look like. And instead of outputting to Elasticsearch, you output to a message broker, AMQP, for example. What? Bullshit appliance, yes, exactly. So you bought this like bullshit search appliance from an unknown search company uh, that maybe it only logs internally or maybe it only logs the syslog if, if you ask it to. So you have it output to your Logstash server itself uh, and you have your other routers and stuff and that ships off to maybe a filtering cluster because maybe you have so many logs per second or your CPU usage on your, on your end nodes is, is too cr crucial to spend parsing data so you send them off unparsed to a fleet of machines that can run Grok and date parsing for you, and then those in turn sh ship them off to Elasticsearch or Nagio, so whatever outputs you happen to want. So we have a way to ship logs, manage your events. So what's next? The whole point of parsing all this crap into some structure and putting it somewhere is so you can do search and analytics on it later. Click. There we go. So this is what the web interface looks like. Uh, the main goal of this is to be able to quickly debug things. Uh, you, you don't get the strong analytics, you don't get like fancy pie charts or crap like that now, because um, I haven't had time to do it yet. But that, that is coming. This is, this is pos uh, I showed a screenshot of Greylog 2 earlier. You can use both of these in the same system. Um, so you search by field. So if you were to parse a host name out of a file, you just search for host name colon and what the host name is and all of those, th all of those events would pop up. You get a graph of results over time. If you ever use Splunk or any other um, uh, log management systems, you get similar results on their default search. Uh, this is just a histogram of hits for this uh, search result over time. You get the results down here. This is, this is interactive. Um, when you click on it, this, field, this, this box pops up of the, and shows you the breakdown of the event. So this is what Grok pulled out of, what is that, a syslog event? Mm, yes, I hope. Um, and from this, this section on the slide, you can uh, click on any of these, these fields and it will modify your search. So you, now you're not writing, you're not figuring out how to use the search language, you're just sort of drilling into your logs. And you can include or exclude. So if you want to exclude this, you would just do a different operation. It happens to be a ship click instead of just a click on the link. So the whole goal of, of this, is to, of Logstash again, is to take your data, put it somewhere and make it awesome. So this is a graph of when I started indexing Twitter. Twitter has, again, that the, the input for Twitter's uh, stream API, I, I did a filter on, I think, HTTP, and Twitter gave me a ton of data per second, and I didn't really know what to do with it, so I started searching for tweets. And this is, tweet, this is ser, uh, search in that same data set for tweets matching pound sysadmin. Also, if you're looking for random data sets that's in stream form, Twitter is like what I would call the lorem ipsum of random data sets. It's kind of like uh, dev random for the human race if you're looking for that. Where's my video, Lebowski? Come on, seriously? Luckily, I come prepared. 
Oh, flash crashed. Son of a bitch. That's what I get for using open source software. Come on, really? All right. I, <laughs> this wasn't even a live demo. Come on. <laughs> Who do I sacrifice to for that? Anyway, so this was going to be a live demo of this. Um, pretend that's animated. It's amazing. The gra th this would have, the video would have main mainly shown that the, the graph itself is interactive, so you can click on those little bars, and it, it like clicking on the, the drill down, it just modifies the time frame that you're looking at, so you can zoom in. And, and this was supposed to be a demo of the, the, the Web 2.0 crap of the Twitter API, but Flash ruins my day, as usual. Uh, so anyway, past and future. Speaker notes, please. Yes. So Logstash was first released uh, November of last year. Um, there's a handful of people using it now, and we got, we've got a, lot, a bunch of patches coming in, um, so people seem happy with it. Um, when I released it, it took less than a day for a, an, uh, an unnamed commercial log management sales guy to start trolling me on Twitter. <laughs> and on that note, I mentioned earlier that open source is a great thing um, to work on for causing fee Say what? Uh, no. Maybe. No comment. Um, on that note, I, I, again, open source is great for causing fear and panic in commercial um, alternatives. Um, a lot of times, people, uh, commercial things like Oracle, they're not really afraid of, of, of MySQL when they bought MySQL. And they bought, do they own Postgres now? I don't know. So I guess if fear turns into buying stuff. But like, competition for, for these, these like, big sales organizations, like Splunk and, and Log, Logic, I think, and some other big companies, they, they go for the big sales model. But if you can eat that, like trick people, or like show them that, you know, there's trick people. There's, there's like free stuff out there that doesn't suck and solves their problem uh, without costing them, you know, like millions of dollars a year for bullshit licenses. Um, I think it's cool. Um, and if they're trolling you, you've already won. Anyway, uh, Logstash 1 was supposed to be due out uh, today, but I drank too much. So it'll be coming out this week. <laughs> but it's, you can use it now. It, you, you can install it now. There's documentation on how to do it. Next. Seriously? <laughs> Drink. <laughs> it's too early. Oh, this, this, this doesn't work anymore either. I hate my life. So anyway, uh, the project site is logstash.net. Uh, the code is up on GitHub. There's issues. We use Jira. Uh, turns out Jira is actually good when you don't have a project manager ruining it. <laughs> um, uh, we have an IRC support channel. There's a couple of us in there pretty much all the time. Um, I also have a ton of Logly and Logstash stickers to give out. And um, basically, yeah, everyone needs a Logstash. Uh, the logo was, was done by Andre. I can't pronounce that because I'm not French. Um, but yeah, anyway. That's it. Any questions? So what Yep. So the question was, how does it scale? What if I have like a million events a day? Is not really much. That does, that turns out to be only a couple, ten or a hundred per second. Um, but you would do something similar to this, where. Um, you sort of tier things out, and you have multiple multiple indexers. The Elasticsearch, if you're using that for the back end, that can scale, that can that can grow. You can use uh, message brokers to help scale out your your parsing infrastructure if you need to do that, which you shouldn't because you should all be logging in structured formats. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, you, you can grow it horizontally on, on, any, on a, any tier, right? You can run it on a single machine. I forget the throughput I've gotten, uh, a couple thousand events per second on one box. Um, but after a point, you, you run out of, of disk space, so that 1,000 per second stops being useful because it goes to zero, right? Eventually, you have, to, you have to add more machines. And ideally, if you're not using filters because you're using st uh, structured log format, um, you should just be able to do whatever the backend is able to write as. And that's why I, I, we allow so many different output uh, targets. Maybe Elasticsearch has a bug, or maybe it has a scaling problem. You want to switch to something else, maybe MySQL or MongoDB or whatever. So it needs to be flexible. Yeah. 
So Grok itself is an open source library I wrote that's external to Logstash. Logstash just uses it as a filter. I, not that I saw. But I, to be fair, I, I started writing Grok like four or five years ago, so I wasn't really, it was for fun then, so I wasn't looking for, is this problem already solved? Yeah. And it's not a hard problem to solve. I mean, if you write a pattern and give it a name, you're just re using like a string substitution. You're saying like, take the word host name and just replace it with that massive regular expression you wrote and tested, right? There's nothing too fancy about Grok. Yeah. And it is, it is, it's open source and separate, and it's written in C. So you can use it from uh, any language if you have the bindings for it. Any other questions? It also has a standalone program that you can write config files for to have it do something similar to a logstash agent where it'll run files or, or tail files or uh, run commands and you can run it, match it through patterns and have sort of like reactions come out of it. Cool, I have stickers, please take them. Uh, yeah, I got 10 minutes, let me, yeah, let me get on Wi-Fi. Maybe. Someday, it will connect to Wi-Fi. <laughs> These are all my videos. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't use Pandora. It always ends up at Britney Spears for me. And, and, and I'm sure it, it's telling me something, but. Fiber? What? <laughs> wow. Oh, Linux, I hate you. I, I had a Mac for a month. It didn't work out well. <laughs> yeah, MacBook Airs are nice and like an Aerobee. It goes well. Today. Oh, hey, Internet. <laughs> I need your help. <laughs> oh. What? You, you just had the internet. You were there. I, I did. <laughs> How'd you check your TDP IP settings? <laughs> it's raining sideways. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah, it'll be a race. First guy to. All right, I'll I'll plug it in if we got a, a dongle, but not Al's dongle, please. Alright. Have a sticker. How do I, oh. <laughs>
We can watch that after. Oh no, full screen. So I apologize for the quality. Anyway, so we, I was searching for something and I clicked on that spike because I'm debugging a problem and there's a bunch of results. Click on a result and there's all this stuff. Um, then I decide that's not what I want to look for. I apologize for the blurriness. Then I search for syslogs. Click on the first thing and I want to, I click on cron which modifies the search to only search for cron logs. That's it, yeah, it's just a quick demo. All that. I'm such a tease. What? Yeah. Exactly. Click. I'm clicking it. So this was uh, the Twitter stream going right to my browser. Um, what? This is not it. I've been duped. How do I make this window smaller? I like how all of you give me different answers. Fucking Mac OS X. That's not it. Oh, hey, there it is. Sick. I need a hammer. I can't, stop. Cool. So this is Twitter flying by, uh, for, going through uh, the Twitter input, being filtered, and then going to a WebSocket output. And now this, again, is like a 30 second demo, but it's, this amount of data is not useful. But if you were to, this is mostly uh, tail dash F for your entire infrastructure with filters, and that's why it's useful. You saw a bunch of uh, terrorist talk, what? Jager bombs. <laughs> oh, that's just because I don't, probably I'm missing fonts because it's Linux. No, this is a uh, this is Google Chrome. So if I had the fonts installed, it would actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. WebSockets. Yeah. Which unfortunately are only supported by like Google Chrome and iOS, iPhone, or iOS, whatever. Yes, yeah. So they were blocks because it saw them as um, Unicode stuff, but I didn't have that font, the, like the Japanese or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So that was a problem. I think I might actually have another more realistic demo. Um, yeah, so this is a little better. So this is, this is just running on my laptop at home. Stuff comes in in real time. Um, it doesn't fade in anymore because at high, high rates the browser's like, I'm trying to fade in 3,000 things, hold. <laughs> so yeah, this is me using logger which lets me write to syslog on a local machine. And this is a hit enter, it pops up. This is all real time stuff going through logstash, straight from syslog and files on disk. Do it. So this is me uh, generating 15 or 25 random logs and then shipping it through. It all comes out pretty quickly. That's all the demos I have, because I, I don't want to taunt the, the live demo gods.